Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. I think you do need some foreign policy nerds like me to come in and explain where the rules of engagement are being changed before our eyes. And that's why someone like me can say this is the most significant uptick in Middle East risk for at least 20 years. Welcome to the City of London. The City of the City. The City of London. The next station is Bank. Please mind the gap between the train and the platform. The financial heart of the country. The City. The City. Welcome to In the City. Stand clear of the doors, please. From Bloomberg Studios in the heart of the square mile, this is our weekly look and the conversations motivating power brokers, policymakers, and financiers the world over. I'm Francine Lacroix. And Dave, you're back in New York this week. I am indeed. Hi, Francine. Hi, Dave. It's been quite a start to the week. It was quite a weekend, actually. You know, we were texting about what we were going to discuss this week, and there was no question we need to discuss the escalating tensions in the Middle East. Uh, That's right. The weekend really was momentous. The images of the attack that Iran launched at Israel, drones and missiles flying over the Dome of the Rock in the center of Jerusalem really struck home what a historic uh, moment it was that Israel and Hamas were coming into, for the first time, a real open conflict. Yeah, I mean, we were, a lot of people were actually really scared that this would turn into a world war. And do you remember when Ian Bremmer, in our first episode of the year, came on with his top 10 risks? He was saying, look, it's really the Middle East that we need to watch out for on the brink. And he said that we're probably not smart enough or lucky enough to avoid an escalation over the coming months. That's right. Talking about sort of the you know the more pessimistic outlook for this year, and it's and it has come to pass, of course. Um, however, we are still waiting. We're taping this on Tuesday. We are still awaiting Israel's response to that barrage of missiles and drones, ninety nine percent of which or so, the vast majority of which it managed to intercept and shoot down. But there is this feeling that the world is on a brink of of something. Uh, potentially much worse, even than we've seen in the past few months. Yeah, the group of seven members, including uh, the Prime Minister of the UK, spoke with one another on Sunday and said they would try to stop an uncontrollable regional escalation. And of course, all of this is against the backdrop of Israel's war in Gaza, which has now passed the six-month mark. Uh, It has left Gaza's population of more than two million people without access, proper access to water, food, power, medicine. It's displaced uh, more than one and a half million people uh, into the southern part of the Gaza Strip. And according to the uh, Hamas-run local health authorities, it has killed more than 33,000 people, of course, after the horrific attacks that uh, Hamas launched on Israel on October the 7th, which killed more than 1,200 Israelis. So let's have a conversation about how long-standing tensions between Israel and Iran came to a head, where those tensions could go next, and what it means for the overall stability of the region. Joining us in the London studio, geopolitical strategist Tina Fordham. Tina is the founder of Fordham Global Foresight, an independent consultancy dedicated to advising boards and the C-suite about geopolitical, socioeconomic and financial risks. Tina, thanks so much for joining us on In the City. Thank you for having me. Uh, So, as Francine and I were just saying, it it really was a, a momentous weekend. I'm sitting in the US on Saturday there was this sense of real foreboding about how events might unfold. Did you feel that this was as historic and as momentous an act by Iran when you saw this unfold over the weekend? Yes, in many ways, because Iran has broken the taboo, first of all, of launching an attack from its own territory. Let's remember that this so-called shadow war that has been in existence for some years between Israel and Iran has been fought through proxies. That's what Hezbollah do and Hamas to a a, a certain extent and the Houthi rebels. They are helping Iran achieve its aims without triggering a conventional military response. And so the decision in Tehran to launch these hundreds of ballistic and cruise missiles and drones from its own territory into Israel was a major uptick in the risk level. And I think market participants have completely got it wrong with the idea that it was somehow meant to be symbolic. But so why did it happen? So this is in retaliation, okay, of an Israeli strike on Damascus. 
Yes, and that also broke the rules. and, and Which killed Iranian generals. In Iranian generals, but in the Iranian consulate in Damascus. And remember that in international law, that is sovereign territory. If, if we take a step back, there's 300 explosive drones and ballistic missiles. What was the end game of Iran? Was it showing a force and telling Israel, don't mess with us? Or was it actually trying to hit targets? It was upping the ante. They couldn't have known the, you know, the kind of uh, performance of the Israeli air defenses, nor the cooperation or the extent of the cooperation between the UK, the US, France and Jordan and possibly others. So it was taking a big risk. They didn't appear to have targeted population centers or things that would have really increased the risk level dramatically. But this was intended to send a message that there would be punishment for Israel for attacking the generals on the sovereign territory of their consulate. And now Israel is in this rather terrible position of trying to calibrate its response. But do you think, Tina, that it was a miscalculation then from the Iranians that the Israeli air defenses would be so effective at shooting them down and that there would be a coalition that would emerge, including Arab states, to intercept the missiles, sort of rallying to Israel's defense. And doesn't that make Iran actually look rather weak? Absolutely. I mean, the end result, without being able to read the minds of, of the mullahs that, that run Iran, the end result has been that Iran's formidable uh, military is not looking so so formidable. So Iran is looking weaker. Remember that it, it also sells those drones to Russia to use in the case of Ukraine. So Iran ends up looking exposed. And the other way that this attack backfired is that it has been a, a gift to uh, Israeli PM Netanyahu, whose you know time on the political clock in Israel was really running short. Remember, just the day before, huge protests, not against his prosecution of the war in, in Gaza, but for not bringing the Israeli hostages held by Hamas home. And so Netanyahu seems to have been given a bit of a break by this attack. So what and, does he do with it? <laughs> and what does he do with it? Exactly. Does he keep the conflict with Iran going? Well, th um, this is the conundrum, right? So, you know, I I get a lot of emails and have conversations with investors and other, you know, sort of business leaders. And every one of them said, but surely Bibi won't bite the hand that feeds him and go against the US. And to which I said, have you not been paying attention? The, the kind of incredible diplomatic pressure that the White House has put the Netanyahu government under to deliver humanitarian aid to the West Bank and everything else. This is a consequence of the end of, of the Pax Americana, right? That Washington can't just call the shots. But but I guess the question is, Tina, does this play to Netanyahu's hand? Because he got so much support to dealing with Iran. So he, he was in tricky hot water because of, of what he's doing in Gaza. But then as soon as you get an attack from Iran, then the allies show up. Yes. And so how does he interpret that, you know, extra... Uh, space that, that he's been given. And what does he do with it? Because he's hanging on by a thread politically, remember, and his coalition is all hardliners who are saying, go big, let's end this problem once and for all. We've heard the Israeli cabinet using the Hiroshima metaphor, saying yeah, that's what ended the World War II, was America's use of the at atomic weapon. And that's all terrifying stuff. And yet, the market consensus is that Israel will send a, a response that's within the gray zone, right? That sends a message but won't inflict damage. That is a hard line to tread. Do you think the markets are miscalculating as well here? I think you said this earlier at the, at the beginning, Tina, that markets were not sensitive enough to the to these risks. But they should they pay more attention to what people sitting around Netanyahu's cabinet table are actually saying? I think that there's an overly simplistic interpretation. I mean, let's be clear, the capacity for conflict and, and dislocation in the Middle East to, in, you know, inflict um, price action on markets is much reduced thanks to the onset of U.S. energy independence and, and shale gas. So, it is certainly true that even even in the worst case scenario, we're not probably looking at a $30 a barrel increase. 
maybe five or six, I'd argue that that still matters in an environment when markets are very focused on what the Fed does next and have downgraded their expectations for rate cuts. War is inflationary. You mentioned the Pax Americana in the end of, obviously, we're in a big election year here in the United States as well. And we've seen Donald Trump come out and, and grandstanding about this, if you want to call it that, about how Iran would never have dared to attack Israel if he yeah. were the president. Well, that's how funny because Iran uh, did attack when he was president and the, and, and the US didn't respond, but sorry. Okay, yeah, continue. short memory there. For yes. no, but So how much is the domestic American political situation, I think, here influencing what is going on? in the Middle East. So the, the Biden administration is in the midst of a, a fight for re-election, right? And the election is just months away. The last thing it wants to be doing is trying to intervene diplomatically to prevent World War III from happening in the Middle East and to prevent Russia from achieving a victory in Ukraine. The combination of these two conflicts, both of which have the potential to become systemic, moving beyond regional is the worst constellation of geopolitical risks that we have faced for some 30 years. The period between now and U.S. elections, everybody's going to try on what they can get away with. Yeah. Including the Chinese? Yes. Well, they're doing it in the Philippines. Yes. Everyone's yes. busy. This is the perfect time to try to take a bite out of territory that you would like back change the facts on the ground. And this is the other the fundamental point that market participants miss. No one is, business might be waiting until US elections to do deals or, or whatever. For challenger actors, which is the term I use, now's the time to increase your negotiating position so that you can keep what you've got. That's what you hope. But so that's why Putin is going for Kharkiv, third largest city that extends his territory because he knows that when there is a, a peace discussion, they're going to say, OK, we want all the things that we've already got. So he's going to try to get as much as possible. And, and Chinese actions in the Philippines are significant. They're blockading the delivery of food aid to Filipino sailors. And Congress does nothing or is frozen. Congress is frozen because it can't. Governments can only do one thing at a time. And the Middle East is now it. Bloomberg Economics have done some projections, and they're saying a direct war between Israel and Iran could push oil up by more than $60 a barrel and tip the world economy into recession. That is a, the sort of the worst case scenario. But even a confined war hits global GDP and sends oil up. So again, it feels like markets, and you've said this now a couple of times, seem to be burying their head in the sand on this. And because so many people, as you said, growing up through these decades of the US-dominated global order just can't imagine a scenario when that really breaks down. I think that's what explains it. You know, I call it kind of behavioral finance meets geopolitics. Remember, it wasn't that long ago we were having these conversations about whether Putin would invade Ukraine. Would he really do that? He's just playing three-dimensional chess. This is just saber-rattling to increase oil prices. Putin, by the way, is a major beneficiary of this uh, kind of geopolitical foment. How do you kind of price this? How do you, you know, rebalance your portfolio? I'm not sure I have the advice about that. But what I do know is that when there is a step change in trend, when you have a disconnect between this incredibly sanguine market sentiment and what pretty much every geopolitical analyst is saying, this is serious, that is at least a reason to pay more attention instead of be as dismissive as we're hearing. So, uh, is there a world in which the US sort of reasserts itself and tries to kind of firm up the Pax Americana, as we've been saying, that it seems that we may get a vote in in the US House on funding for Israel and potentially looking again at the question of funding for the Ukrainians, which has been, of course, held up now for so long. Could a shock like this kind of wake America up a bit to the need for it to continue to fund the resistance against Russia and Ukraine, continue to fund its allies around the world and kind of reassert itself on the world stage? Or do you think that status is kind of forever gone? It's a really important question. And I think it also just exposes, I mean, here you have me and Francine, an American and Italian living in, in London and you a Brit in, in the US. I've never been more conscious of the kind of ge geographic disconnect in, in risk perception. I mean, Americans really do feel um, inviable, you know, in many ways. U.S. markets are performing. The U.S. is growing. 
this is Europe's problem. Um, investors have really taken on board the Trump talking points. Europe should be paying more for defense. I come back to them and say Europe is paying more. There are very few countries not paying the 2% at NATO. But the U.S. periodically goes through these waves of isolation, and this is one of them. But I think it is also due to the fact that uh, Americans don't appreciate how they benefit from the globalized economy and financial markets, too. But, Tina, can, can the U.S. afford it? So if Donald Trump gets the into the White country House, in the world. it doesn't mean they can afford it, right? It doesn't mean they're willing to pay. Right. It doesn't mean they're willing to pay. It doesn't mean that, you know, they can continue going into debt. It doesn't mean that the next president will support all of this. Do, the, do they have the bandwidth of doing, of trying to, to get involved in so much foreign affairs? You know, I had an interesting observation from one of my clients in Washington, D.C. He said Trump is a shadow president. And as long as, you know, he is in that position, kind of pulling the strings in the House, we won't get that aid bill. 60 million in aid to Ukraine, which is something that the American public supports and that the U.S. Congress supports now being held up in the House. And it is existential, not only for Ukraine, let's maybe, if you want to be brutal and take the humanitarian consideration out of it, the fact that Ukraine will cease to as an entity in many ways. Again, it's about that perception of what constitutes U.S. security and is in the U.S. national interest and and self-interest. And I think that link has been broken in many ways. Tina, can I ask you about the, the, the alliances in the Middle East that have been forged or reforged Right, because of this threat coming from Iran. So suddenly Israel was supported by Jordan. In certain parts, I think it was also supported by Saudi Arabia. Does this change anything in in Netanyahu's mind? This is a very interesting kind of reshuffle of strange bedfellows going on because you will have seen the the vehement denials of uh, an Arab-Israeli coalition of of the willing emerging. And I, I don't think that's really part of Netanyahu's story. But Jordan says for its part, it was defending its own airspace, that if a foreign object trespasses its airspace, it's going to shoot it down. And I think that makes a lot of sense. But what it really underscores is the mutual self-interest amongst these countries in the region. And you know, Jordan and Israel have had a peace treaty for decades, let's not forget. The UAE and Saudi cooperating, is that unusual? Remember, Iran and Saudi were at war until Saudi and Tehran agreed a a pause, a normalization of relations. And then we have the fact that Saudi itself is saying that uh, the Hamas attack was meant to foil the normalization of relations between Israel and the Arab world without something being done about the Palestinians. Tina, will, will we see a ceasefire in Gaza? I don't think that... The Israelis will agree to a ceasefire without the release of the hostages, put it that way. So that means an assault on Rafa that has to happen, does it not? I think that is right back on the table. I don't think that this Iranian attack on Israel changes the military calculus for Israel in Gaza, despite the international condemnation and the fact that, you know, just about every international authority has said that famine is happening, a man-made famine happening in Gaza now. The stated goal of the Israeli government to wipe Hamas off the face of the earth, I think, is the phrase they've used. There are interesting parallels, aren't there, with after the September the 11th, 2001 attacks in the United States with, with President George W. Bush's war on terror and how that lasted for so many years and um, set up these goals that were really unachievable. Surely, is it not an impossible aim to completely eradicate Hamas? And will Israel not have to get to the point where they admit that and call call a ceasefire regardless? I think we can agree that eradicating a non-state actor like Hamas or the Taliban is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to do. I don't know that means Israel will stop trying to do it. Is there anything the U.S. can can do to make them stop? Well, we saw the kind of veiled threats to reduce aid. But remember that for Republicans in Congress, particularly the evangelical Christians like Johnson, the Speaker of the House, the support for the state of Israel is in a different bucket than support for Ukraine and, and for even for Taiwan, interestingly. So Netanyahu will really be testing the patience, the limits of the American political establishment, because even its sort of core 
support amongst American Jews is under threat. Israel's international reputation has been damaged by the offense in Gaza. Can that be rebuilt? It's going to be difficult. And this uh, Iranian attack is not enough, certainly, to put Israel back in the kind of victim place in the equation. I mean, another scenario that seems quite likely as well, assuming that Iran and Israel step back from direct confrontation, is a flare-up of hostilities with Hezbollah in in Lebanon. And and so that's going back to more of a proxy war, but a full-blown conflict between Hezbollah and Israel. How do you see that playing out? Does Israel have the capacity to fight war on multiple fronts at the moment? I think we shouldn't underestimate the collective trauma um, that uh, was meted out on on Israelis after the October 7th attack and the willingness to defend the state of Israel and the, the sense that this is an existential crisis. Uh, and it, it seems hard for, you know, for, for people outside the region to to appreciate that. And if you read the Israeli press, you, you can see it. And the real challenge is the choreography, if you will. And that's where these gray zone kinds of responses come into play. And how do you calibrate a response that inflicts damage on your enemy, uh, on the aggressor, without provoking a full-scale military conflict, which everyone says they don't want, or alienating your number one supporter, because Israel probably can't do without U.S. support. And and that is why Biden has taken this risk, really, alienating the left wing of the Democratic Party in support of Israel because of the fear of an all-out conflagration. Tina, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to this week's In the City from Bloomberg. This episode was hosted by me, Francine Lacroix, with David Merritt. It was produced by Summer Sadi, with additional editing by Blake Maples. Brendan Newman is our executive producer. Sage Bauman is head of podcasts. And special thanks to Tina Fordham. Please do subscribe, rate and review wherever you listen to podcasts.